Hey, what's up, guys? We're back, and this week it's uh, UFC 226 and the uh, tough finale. I'm going to start with UFC 226. I'm going to try to uh, do the tough finale um, on uh, Tuesday, probably Tuesday afternoon. Uh, stuff to, you know, look over a couple things on that card, just uh, finishing up, and then I'll give it to you guys. But um, for UFC 226, everyone knows we have a, um, you know, a really stacked card. It's um, you know, International Fight Week, so they always deliver on International Fight Week, and it's Stipe against, uh, Daniel Cormier, we've been waiting for this one for a long time, so, just gonna jump right into it, and the first fight of the night, um, you know, is one of the weaker fights on the card, is Jamie Moyle against Emily Whitmire, and, you know, in my opinion, the line's a little off here, I think this is actually a pretty close fight, even though it's, um, you know, not the highest level fight, they're both, uh, you know, primarily grapplers. I would say Jamie Moyle is definitely the one that's more, you know, proven. But Emily Whitmire is coming off a loss to Jillian Whitmire or Jillian Robertson on the Tough 26 finale, and Jillian Robertson's proven to become a pretty good fighter. She just beat Molly McCann, who was the Cage Warriors champion. And uh, but Whitmire's still raw with her striking for sure. She needs to improve her defense, add some variation to her striking, along with some better footwork. She mainly looks to throw the one-two. She occasionally mixes in a leg kick. Pretty athletic. Good hand speed, actually. She can close the distance. Land shots fairly quickly. Doesn't move her feet well when you when you cut her off, though. Can get very tall. Doesn't like to move backwards. Tries to throw longer combos in the pocket. Um, when she does that, she gets very tall as well, and she can get clipped. She doesn't move her head off the center line. But she's a wrestler. She has decent entries, good clinch takedowns, good job getting strong body lock positions, finding an angle, dumping her opponents. She's pretty strong and physical for the weight class. She's going to be moving down to 115. Um, she'll control the position in the clinch. She can land the takedown right away, look for trips. Uh, she can land some knees, you know. But she uh, she got an armbar against Christina Marks on the show, then lost to Roxanne Matafari. She's not very good off her back, but she's such slight improvements in the Jillian Robertson fight. And good heart to persevere, survive through bad positions. You know, she was able to get a sweep in that fight, but eventually got arm barred. Overall, she doesn't do a good job of, um, you know, just defending on the ground, though. She lets her opponents get in a dominant position on top, get the mount, take the back. And, um, you know, like I said, she was able to shake Robertson off her back. Actually landed a couple of nice ground and pound shots. But she did get armbarred fairly quickly after the transition. And, um, you know, I think she's going to have the size advantage in this fight for sure. She's going to be fighting Jamie Moyle, 1-1. One and one. And Moyle's kind of short and compact. Uh, she has better movement and more variation on the feet than Whitmire. She throws a jab right hand. Likes to throw a lot of kicks on the outside. She throws front kicks to the body, body, uh, you know, body kicks, round kicks. Decent leg kicks. Much more fluid with her kicks than Whitmire is. Comes in on different angles. And she said she's been working hard in her boxing. So we're going to see if that's going to show here. She isn't very fast or explosive. She can't get caught on the outside. Struggle to connect with her punches. Because she doesn't have the longest reach. She has okay wrestling. Decent double legs. But she really gets them off uh, if you're getting over aggressive or just times it well. She doesn't move her head when she kicks. And can't get countered clean. Her face swells and bleeds very easily. So... Definitely takes a lot of facial damage. She got beat up and dominated by Vivian Pereira in her last fight. Hasn't fought in a while. She can get control in the clinch against the cage. Doesn't seem super strong there. I think Whitmire is going to have the advantage in the clinch. And I think this is just a much closer fight than the line, like I said. Uh, I think Moyle's like a minus 300. And I don't really know what she's done to, uh, you know be that big of a favorite. I actually am going to go with Emily Whitmire. I think she's going to be the stronger athlete. I think they're both pretty low level. They both don't have any striking that's going to be, you know, um, impactful in my opinion. I don't think either of them are going to hurt each other. And um, I think Emily Whitmire, when they clinch up, is going to be the one that's going to win the, win the grappling. So I think she's going to take her down. I think she's going to just grind her out, win a fairly uneventful, boring decision in that one. And then up next, you have Lando Venata. Fighting against Shakar Close. Very fun fight. You know, any fight with Lando Venata is fireworks. And Close kind of brings his own cocky style to the Octagon, too, so he's fun to watch. And Venata, you know, he's a longtime staple of the Jackson Wing camp. Dynamic striker. Good wrestling. 
He has tremendous movement, very flowy, hard to time, constantly faking and feigning, trying to keep you thinking. Keeps his hands low, uses good head movement to avoid shots, comes back with crisp counters, very nice punch combinations, nice kicks. He throws the Sanchai kick, nice spinning wheel kicks, extremely fluid. His knockout of John McDessey, you know, was a thing of beauty. He has nice leg kicks. He has a good spinning back fist as well, a lot of variety with the shots. Former wrestler, he will shoot on some takedowns. Doesn't have great finishing ability after he gets you down, though. He is extremely fast, athletic. He'll dart in and out. He makes it hard for his opponents to find the range. Very hard to hold down. Tamar took him down a couple times, but couldn't hold him down at all. He is, a, like I said, a former wrestler. So I think that, you know, in this fight, I think that he's going to be able to deny a lot of the entrance of Jakar close. He does have a very good chin. Um, but he is starting to get hit with a lot of shots. You have to wonder when, um, you know, that's going to start to go away for him. And uh, he has his back against the wall here. He's coming off a loss and a draw. So he's going to be ready to go on this one, in my opinion. He has had cardio issues in the last couple of fights. Also had issues with his nose breaking. And uh, he can get bad with his defense when he gets tired. But he's fought some pretty great fighters, man. He fought Bobby Green, David Tamor, and Tony Ferguson. I think all three of those guys... Um, you know, beat your car close as well. So those are three pretty hard matchups there. And, um, you know, so I'm not really going to take anything away from Lando in those fights. I think that he's going to be the better striker, throw more volume, more variations than close. But close is a good wrestler, very athletic, tries to bully you in the cage almost, very cocky, almost shows disdain for your striking, walks you down with his hands down, mugging you, talking shit. Good leg kicks, especially the low calf kicks. Um, you know, his camp's known for that. He's coming out of the MMA lab. Close is extremely explosive. He shows it. You know, he closes the distance very quickly. Has some nice flying knees, big punches. Um, but he isn't very aggressive. He does a lot of mugging, you know, talking shit instead of closing the distance and landing himself. I think he doesn't have good striking in the pocket. So he wants to be all the way in or all the way on the outside. He will close the distance with big uppercuts, big hooks. He doesn't leave himself open to shots to the body. He likes to close distance, get in the clinch, though. He will hold you against the cage, land knees, elbows, you know, the Marco who has foot stomps. He'll go for the body lock, double leg takedowns. But I wouldn't say he's the amazing wrestler. He's a good wrestler, but not, you know, super high level. Hasn't really held down many of his opponents besides Devin Powell in the UFC. Doesn't have big power, isn't a finisher. And this fight comes down to if Lando Venati can keep kicking range. Not let close make up the distance, you know, muck up the fight, make it ugly. And um, I think Venata's, you know, being a former wrestler, being a very explosive athletic guy himself, I think he's going to be able to do that. I think close throws enough volume to win a decision against someone like Lando. And um, don't think he has a big enough grappling advantage to take down or hold Lando against a cage for two rounds. So I'm going to say Venata wins a decision there. And um, I think that's a good fight. I think it's a fairly close fight, but I think... Lando wins a pretty clear decision. And up next, one of the closest fights on the card, one of the fights that I've been going back and forth on for sure, and it's Dan Hooker against Gilbert Burns. Very good fight. Both these guys seem like they're peaking now. Dan uh, Hooker's on a three-fight winning streak, while Gilbert Burns has won two in a row. It's a great fight. You know, it's a fight versus a tactician, versus a very explosive athlete. You know, Dan Hooker looked fantastic since moving to city kickboxing and up to lightweight. Definitely be uh, getting some good looks leading up to this fight with uh, training with Israel Adesanya. Israel Adesanya fights the night before in the main event, so they're both going to be peaking at the same time. Hooker's a long, lanky kickboxer. Good takedown defense. He has great guillotines on your takedowns. Really likes to, you know, attack the guillotine so you don't go for the takedown. He's going to want to keep the distance this fight. He has a great jab, nice straight. He uses great movement, nice angles, pops you with shots from the outside, calmly avoiding your shots. Good head movement, keeps a high guard, does a great job not getting hit, never stands in front of you, does a great job landing shots, keeping you off balance, tending to close the distance, just kind of pot shotting you from the outside. Great kicks, nice leg kicks, good round kicks, nice snap kicks to the body, nice head kicks, really nice snap front kick. You knocked out Ross Pearson with that. Knocked out Jim Miller with a really nice knee. So he definitely has a lot of variation. Very dangerous with his strikes. He's riding a three-fight finish streak. And he's really taking no damage at all in those fights. He's a veteran. He does a great job picking up the pace as the fight goes on. 
great cardio. He knows how to win a decision. Has a good chin. He's hard to finish. He can be taken down by relentless takedown attempts like his fight versus Jason Knight. He does do a good job staying calm, not getting taking much damage on the ground. But Gilbert Burns is definitely a different animal if he gets you down. And Gilbert Burns has been riding a hot streak as well recently. Back-to-back -back highlight real KOs, one-punch knockouts. He's a jiu-jitsu world champion. Now he's showing big KO power, so he's very dangerous on the feet and on the ground. Very big, lightweight. He actually has had some problems making weight in the past. And uh, he's definitely going to have the size advantage in this fight, even though Dan Hooker is fairly big as well. He is very athletic. He can close the distance very quickly. Goes for takedowns. Has nice, uh, you know, hooks that he tries to land. He has okay striking. Not the greatest striking, I would say. Huge power in his right hook. Nice body kick. He has a nice straight right hand. He'll go for the, uh, go high with his kicks as well. Attack with the legs with kicks. Nice leg kicks. He throws everything with full power. Really loads up on his shots. Makes him a bit slow, a bit obvious with what he's trying to land. But he also makes him dangerous, you know, that's why he lands with such power. He attacks in straight lines on the feet, doesn't use a lot of angles or movements, but he is light on his feet, kind of, you know, tries to, uh, you know, stay in and out, but he doesn't have uh, great defense, kind of stands right in front of you, actually. He'll just back straight up and shell up if you uh, start to throw a flurry, but he does have great heart, he has a good chin, dangerous early, he'll go hard for the finish, decent double leg entries, but he doesn't finish them well. If he can't get in the clinch... He can bully guys, slam him to the mat, definitely has big power, good body locks. On top, he's very heavy, has great submissions. He'll attack with arm bars, rear naked chokes. People can get up against the fence with him. He has decent cardio, but he slows down a bit in round three. This is a very close fight. Burns should try to close the distance, smother Hooker, while Hooker will want to piece him up from the outside. And I'm going to go with Dan Hooker here. I think he's going to use good movement, kickboxing, keep Burns at bay. And I think Burns is going to be a little bit, um, you know, too happy to strike, a little bit too happy to stay on the outside, try to land that one bomb. I think he's going to start going for takedowns, but I think it's going to be a little bit, you know, too little, too late. I think that Dan Hooker, even if he gets taken down, he'll be able to get back up, stay calm in positions. And um, I say Dan Hooker is going to get a decision victory in this one. And um, that is a fairly close fight that I have been going back and forth on it, so wouldn't recommend betting on that, but... Very close fight. And up next, Max Griffith against Curtis Melender. This is another great fight, man. This is going to be a fantastic striking war. Max Griffith's coming off the biggest win of his career against Mike Perry. And Melender just had a highlight real KO against Thiago Alves. And for Max Griffith, he's a very powerful, very athletic guy. Very fast hand speed, good knockout power. Great one-two. And um, he'll keep a ton of volume on you. He has a nice clean straight right hand. Very powerful. He could drop you with it. Good left hook, good left straight as well. Good footwork, he has a, a good job of, um, you know, landing, moving laterally and not getting hit. He throws nice leg kicks. He'll go high with that kick from time to time. He will catch you in the pocket with straight hand looping punches. Sticks in the pocket longer than most fighters. Has a ton of heart, showed that in, in a pretty good performance against, uh, um, you know, Dos Santos, Elizio Zalecki, where both guys were dropped multiple times. You know, that was a war. Showed his heart, showed his chin in that fight, and showed his power. And um, he has a big questionable takedown defense, but hard to keep down, especially against the cage. He did the scrambles. Does a good job getting top position or disengaging back to the feet. He has uh, cardio issues in the past, but he looked great all three rounds in his last fight. And uh, looked good in his fight against Elizio Zaleski Dos Santos as well. And uh, I think he's going to be the stronger grappler in this fight if it goes there. Melender has a very questionable takedown defense, struggles to get off the cage. I think Griffin needs to pressure, get in boxing range, piece up Curtis Melender. Uh, and, you know, um, he kind of reminds me of, you know, prime Mike, uh, Michael Johnson, you know. He really has those fast hands, likes to keep the volume on you, throws the straight punches, sticks in the pocket longer than most guys. And, you know, he's dangerous versus anyone, man. And, um... You know, for Curtis Melender, Curtis Melender is a long and rangey striker. He uses his reach really well. He'll throw a nice jab, throw a nice straight right hand as well. Dig to the body with his right hand. Nasty left hook, good power on it. Throw a double jab, straight right hook combo. His right hand's very fast and accurate. Very tricky striker. You always looking to set up a knee or a nasty high kick. 
He finished Thiago Alves with a nasty knee in his last fight. Two TKO head kick finishes before that. So he's right in a three-fight finish streak. He has hard leg kicks. His defense is nice. He changes it up. He'll use good slip head movement at times to avoid shots, come back with counters. Then he'll do a good job of hand fighting, coming over the top with shots. Good job staying patient, forcing you to come to him so he can try to walk you into something. He stands very tall, almost square right in front of you, which makes him dangerous from both sides, but it also makes him easy for me to take down, easy to clinch, push up against the cage. Sometimes K get caught staying too tall with his hands low on the second or third punch in a combo, and I think that's where Max can catch him. He's very good in the clinch. He has nice elbows, really great knees, turn up the pressure and hurt people with elbows. He did that against Kevin Holland. He could be too complacent off his back against the cage, lose the round there. He does have good heart. I've seen him drop by Kevin Holland and come back to win. But I just think Max Griffin's being overlooked at this spot. He has extremely fast hands and close the distance very quickly. Very um, explosive guy. And I think that's the type of guy that Melender's going to struggle with. You know, a tall guy that likes to lean back, likes to really accentuate his reach. And, um, you know, I think that maybe on that second or third um, punch of combination coming forward, is either where Melender's going to land the knockout shot or where Max Griffith's going to land the punches to knock out Melender. And uh, I'm going to go with Max Griffith. I'm going to say he gets the, um, lands a blitz combo, drops him, and finishes him with ground and pound. And um, that's another fight that I think is an extremely close fight. And um, up next, we have Rob Font against Rafael Asuncao. And uh, this is a great fight as well. You know, Rob Font has a great win against Tavis Almeida his last time out while... Rafael Sansa had that great knockout, and he's always, you know, extremely dangerous at the top of the division. And Rafael Sansa is extremely good. I think he's extremely underrated. Good striking, great striking defense, great uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, good takedown defense, really good cardio. And he's primarily a counter-striker. He likes to pressure, stay in your face, making you fight backwards, but throws a lot of fakes and fakes, tries to draw you out before he throws himself. He throws great leg kicks, very heavy, and also comes over the top with a beautiful counter right hand. Likes to keep the fight at a methodical pace. Does that through his pressure countering, making his opponents weary of throwing due to his counter shots. And uh, wins by basically pot charging from the outside. He does a great job skipping the jab, coming over the top with the right hand, landing the leg kick. I think that's going to be huge in this fight. He's extremely hard to hit, especially to the head. Very tricky head movement. He switches stance off of his kicks, throws nice body kicks, slipping back, and uh, throwing them when you attack the strike. Great timing on his takedowns, but does not utilize them as much. And uh, I don't believe he will use them much in this fight. He had an amazing takedown defense, and if you do get him down, he gets right back up. Very good at winning close rounds, close decisions. And he's been fighting the elite of the elite of the division. You know, this guy has wins over names like uh, TJ Dillashaw, the current champion. And, um, you know, he has the third most wins in um, UFC Bantamweight history. Ten wins. His record is 10-1 and at 135 pounds. Just an incredible record. And he's coming off a highlight reel knockout. But you have to wonder when the wheels are going to fall off for Asuncao as well, man. He's 35. Getting another up-and-comer here. Not a title shot like he wanted. But he's shown zero slippage whatsoever. And um, not going to bank on it until I see it. So... Going to just judge him off what he is. And for Ralph Font, Ralph Font's a very technical log striker. He's dangerous. Four knockouts in the UFC. Very great jab. Uses it to set up his right hand. Nice front kick to the face. He's done match now with that. He fights at a very deliberate pace as well. And only starts to throw multiple shot combos when he sees the availability. His combinations are awesome at times, though. He will land in the body and head. Has great timing on his knees to the Knees to the head. Very good in clinch in uh, close quarters. He will unload with big knees, elbows in the clinch, along with massive uppercuts. He finished on in his last fight with those big uppercuts in the clinch. He's been running out of skills. He usually tries to get a takedown in about a minute or two in round one. He had a good guillotine versus Andrade. And um, I think that, you know, he's going to be a little bit slower with his head speed than in his entries than... Um, uh, sets out, but he's much uh, better when he's moving forward than moving backwards. Seems to struggle when uh, face people can push it back, can put combinations together. Doesn't like pressure very much. He was hit with over overhand hooks uh, versus Pedro Munoz. You know, rock to that guillotine. 
He is heavy on his front leg. He can't get kicked. I think he's going to play a Sunsouls game, though. I think he's a thinker a little bit. He's technical, looking for openings to finish the fight. I don't think he's someone that really goes for it. And um, a Sunsouls, I think he's not going to give him any openings. I think he's going to lay leg kicks, possibly time takedowns. And I think he's going to take his typical close Rafael Sunsouls type decision here. And, um, you know, just continue to roll and go 11-1 and in the UFC. And uh, up next, we have a short notice fight with uh, Mike Perry against Paul Felder. Um, this was originally supposed to be Yancey Medeiros. Yancey got injured, he had to pull out. So uh, they brought in Paul Felder to fight him after um, uh, Ally Quinta pulled out of the Justin Gaethje fight. They put James Vick against Ally Quinta and Paul Felder against Mike Perry. So they changed up that main event and then put Mike Perry against Paul Felder. And uh, very, very interesting fight here. You know, Paul Felder's been riding a high at 155 pounds. Uh, very good ground and pound elbows. Everyone knows about his very nice kicking game. Um, you know, nice jab. Really has been looking pretty sharp since he went to Duke Rufus camp. And for Mike Perry, you know, um, training at Jackson Wink now. So he definitely should be showing some improvements. Definitely, you know, as a raw talent, he definitely has good, you know, raw skills. He's very balanced on the feet. Doesn't really get out of position a lot. Um, you know, very athletic, extremely explosive. That one-punch knockout power. He has a great chin. You know, he's a fighter, has that heart, has that will. And, uh, you know, I think Paul Felder as well. I think Paul Felder likes to bang too. But, um... I don't know if he's ever felt someone, you know, that could hit quite as hard as Mike Perry. But, you know, for Mike Perry, he's someone that his last fight really regressed a little bit. He uh, didn't show what he said he was going to show. He said he was working on his movements and he was working on his, you know, longer combinations. And he was kind of just looking for that one-punch knockout, not being technical like he usually is. And for Paul Felder, you know, the game plan's out there to beat someone like a Mike Perry. You just have to be technical. You have to move your feet. You have to stay on the outside, you have to lay a lot of kicks, and you have to fight kind of like a bitch a little bit, and, um, you know, for Paul Felder, I just don't know, man, I feel like Paul Felder's gonna go in there, and, um, uh, I don't know, man, I think Mike Perry's gonna catch Paul Felder, man, I think Mike Perry's gonna knock him out, uh, I don't know why, I, I don't know if it's a smart pick, but I'm going with Mike Perry, I think he's gonna find Paul Felder, I think he's gonna catch him. And I think he's going to finish him, and I think that Paul Felder's never felt that kind of power before. And um, I think that Mike Perry traded Jackson Weeks. I, I'm just going to I'm gonna give it to Mike Perry here. I think it's going to be a, you know, it is a similar matchup to Ally Quinta for Paul Felder, but I don't know. Something's just telling me Mike Perry's going to get the win in that one. The last time Mike Perry fought a 155er, Alex Reyes, he dominated him. So I'm going with Mike Perry there. I'm going to go with Mike Perry. By first round knockout. And up next we have Paulo Casa against uh, Uriah Hall. You know, Boracina, the eraser, baby. He's a pretty fun fighter to watch. And then Uriah Hall as well. Everyone knows about Uriah Hall. And, um, you know, for Paulo Costa, he's taken the UFC by storm a little bit. 3 0, 3 TKOs in his first three fights. Really hasn't fought anyone very good, though. He's going to be big and taking a big step up here against Uriah Hall. And, um,. You know, Paul Acosta, he's a very sick athlete, big imposing figure for the division. He likes to walk you down, get your back, gets the cage, strike from there. Does a great job staying log, not smothering his shots while keeping your back, gets the cage. Great jab, great straight right hand with good hand speed. He'll throw a nice front kick to the body. He'll come over the top with the right hand, has big power. Does a great job seeing the side you're trying to move away from. Throw a kick to the head, to the body. Um, you know, to keep you in front of him. Good job cutting off the cage. Nice hard uppercut. It's actually a good match, in my opinion, for Boricidia. Hall struggle gets people with smother, with jam his kicks, close the distance. And that's kind of Paulo's game. Paulo's someone who has good double and single leg takedowns as well. Nice heavy ground and pound. People can't get up from bottom on him. He has great balance on the feet. Never gets out of position. Pretty good cardio. But I have seen him tired after uh, pushing some takedowns on him. A fight on tough. He has extreme uh, confidence. He's riding high. Great chin. And for Yair Hall, he's an absolute athletic freak. Who has some of the most dynamic strike in UFC history for sure. Very Anderson Silva-like. 
in his movement, throws counters, blinding speed, great timing, good knockout power. Can definitely find the win out of nowhere. You saw that in his last fight against Chris Jocko. You've seen that against Gegard Mousasi. You know, landing spinning back kicks, flying elbows. He's good off his back as well. He'll attack with submissions. But it is a weak point. It can't be controlled. Can't be finished with ground and power. Kind of seems like he gets stuck and quits in certain positions on the ground. At times, he seems like he lacks that killer instinct, desire to bite down on the mouthpiece. And, um... He'll back up against the cage too much, allow himself to fight off the back foot. Questionable takedown defense, he can get caught in position on the ground, lose by TKO. And um, a lot of comebacks get flash knock you out of nowhere. And um, definitely could do that to Borchino, you know, he's definitely dangerous. Borchino comes in on straight lines without moving his head. And if he catches up with one of those spinning kicks, one of those overhand rights, it could be nights out for a... Uh, Paulo Costa, but I think the more likely thing to happen in that fight is Paulo Costa's going to swarm your eye hall early. He's really had a problem with starting uh, a little bit slow recently, and I think he's going to get him out of there early in that first round. And now uh, I'm going to Paulo Costa in that one. And I'm next to move on to my most confident pick of the night. It's going to be Gokan Saki to defeat Kolo Roundtree. Really confident in this pick. Gokan Saki, you know, trying to get in the groove of things again after sitting out for nearly three years. From any combat sport, and uh, you know, obviously sitting up for MMA for 13 years, so that's a long time. And uh, he's gonna be taking his second MMA fight in less than a year, so he's getting back on the horse a little bit. He had a good win against Luis Henrique da Silva in his last fight, and he's one of the greatest kickboxers of all time, record 83 and 12. He's fought, um, you know, some of the best guys in that sport. He knows what it's like to be in intense competition. He's fought guys like. Alistair Overeem when he was Ubering like 265 pounds. He's fought guys like Rico Verhoeven. You know, he's fought guys like Tyrone Spong. So he's fought the best of the best out there in kickboxing. And he's one of the most intense and competitive guys in combat sports. I really think he knows what it takes to push through and win. He has an okay jab, but his left hand is what is really money. Nasty left hook, big power. It's one of the fastest hooks I've ever seen, to be honest, for someone that size. And he can lead with the left hook as kind of a leaping left hook as well, where he could step back and counter with it like he was doing against De Silva. Nasty leg kicks, great speed on his kicks. And he could throw that with no setup, making it very hard to time or see coming. Nice lead leg kick as well. He'll throw the legs to the body and to the head. He has great snap kicks to the head. He'll go to the body with the snap kick as well. Nice left head kick. He'll throw knockout. Um, strikes with his left head kick. He'll throw counter kicks with his left head kick that are just very nice. You don't see him coming. And this is only his third pro MMA fight, but I actually think that Luis Henrique da Silva is arguably a better fighter than Khalil Roundtree. And he showed great time with his counter left hand, straight left hand. Um, in that fight, he dropped da Silva in less than one minute. Um, you know, threw his left head kick as well. Had good success with that. Good job defending takedown attempts of De Silva early. He's able to disengage, go back to striking range. He was throwing a nice right hook to the head. And uh, good body leg kicks. He was showing good lateral movement, not just staying right in front of De Silva. Did a great job pouring on the volume and the pressure when he had you trapped against the cage. He didn't get rocked to the clinch against the cage with an elbow. But, you know, he was able to KO De Silva in the same exchange, just second slayer with the left hook. He would get tired. But, you know, that was his first MMA fight in 13 years. His first combat sports fight in nearly three years. I expect him to be much more comfortable, even more ready to fight here July 7th. And Khalil Roundtree is a dangerous striker. Big power, throws nice straight right, right down the middle, good hooks. He has nice body kicks. He'll go for it early, extremely aggressive. He'll get in the pocket, try to push you back with powerful combos, just sheer power. He's floor guys like Corey Hendricks and Tyson Pedro early. Only to get tired, caught, and lose. And, um, you know, that's basically what he is, man. If you can't finish him in two minutes, you're going to come back and beat him. He wings wide shots in the pocket. People seem like they're scared to engage because of the power. But Saki, I definitely don't think he's going to be scared to engage. Um, I think Saki will stay in the pocket. I think he's going to land the tighter, cleaner shots. And Roundtree isn't a grappler. He doesn't have good clinch or takedowns. He went for a guillotine against uh, Electric in his last fight. Completely gassed. And uh, Roundtree breaks, and in his interviews, says stuff that's very odd, to say the least. He seems kind of like he's a mental midget a little bit. And Saki's fought in wars, knows how to push, knows how to win a tough fight. 
This is an easier matchup to me than his debut was. And I uh, knocked the rust off in his debut. Taylor made fight for Saki here. I think if Saki gets a win, they may put him, you know, in a main event over in Turkey, something like that. So I think this is a big fight for him as well. I think he's going to land that clean left hook, straight left hook, or I mean um, left hook and a counter punch uh, in an exchange within three minutes, man. I'm going to go Konsaki by knockout. And uh, that's going to be our most confident pick of the night there. And uh, really, I'm pretty confident in that one. And up next, you have Michael Kess against Anthony Pettis. And this is another fight that I'm pretty confident in. You know, Anthony Pettis just really hasn't been looking like himself lately. Um, you know, in his fight against Justin Poirier, you know, kind of submitted to uh, something that wasn't even a uh, submission. Just gave up because he had a problem with his rib or something. Not really sure. Even against when he fought against Jim Miller. Really wasn't that di- that dynamic. Anthony Pettis obviously got TKO'd by Max Holloway. And uh, everyone knows about Anthony Pettis, though. Great on the outside. Nasty kicks. Really nice body kick. Very fast. But recently, man, I haven't seen him throwing as many strikes, but he's been... Uh, Weary to, weary to throw. He's kind of a little bit chinny now, in my opinion. He's never dealed well with the type of style that Michael Kies has, who's just a grinder, someone that likes to get you against the cage, grapple you, not give you any room to breathe, try to take you down, get your back, and submit you. And, um, you know, I just think Michael Kiesa, Michael Kiesa might not have the greatest striking, but he's still pretty dangerous with the striking. You know, it's not terrible. He, um... Is good in the clinch. Has good straight punches. Um, very tough, big and long. He's a southpaw. Bit awkward. He does have a problem overextending, leaving himself vulnerable, especially when he throws kicks. Likes to throw that left kick to the body, into the head, fall with punches. He has pop in his hands. I think he can hurt Pettis. And he will go in the pocket rec- recklessly. He can tag you with a jab or a cross. Can't be countered as well, but he has a great chin. He's really big, 6'1". You can definitely see that in a clinch. Very strong, good leverage, good body locks, lands knees to the body. He likes to elbow, exit the clinch with elbows and punches. He uses that body lock to land takedowns as well. Has a really nice single leg takedown. Does a solid job of defending takedown himself. Very tight jiu-jitsu. And I just think that he's going to be able to, uh, you know, get the, get him down, get that rear naked choke, man. He's been able to do it to really good black belts. Guys like Jim Miller, Benil Dariush. And Anthony Pettis, he's 2-5 in his last seven fights, taking a ton of punishment. Um, but he's still, you know, he's still dangerous. You know, he'll throw some of those jumping spitty hill kicks, jumping roundhouse kicks, kicks off the cage, obviously. When you let him get space, definitely someone that's going to, um, you know, style on you. And his jiu-jitsu on his guard is nasty. Great job controlling the wrist. He'll attack with triangles, throws legs up extremely fast. Slick guillotine, good arm bars, good kimuras, nice sweeps. Um, but he doesn't have an amazing top game. A lot of times he'll just stand back up. He was landing a very nice straight right hand against Poirier. But I just think Kiesa is much bigger than Poirier, than Poirier. And I believe bigger than Pettis as well. And I think he's going to be constantly pushed it back, forced over the clinch in the pocket. And um, Pettis really got beat up against Dustin Poirier. And, um, you know, after not being finished in his first 25 fights, he's been finished in two of his last three fights. So I think that's a really telling. And um, I guess he's a big grappler. He's fresh. And um, I believe that he's riding high with his confidence. I think Pettis obviously isn't. Pettis had the opportunity to fight Khabib Nurmagomedov on short notice for the title. Um, very similar matchup to Kessa. He turned it down. So that just kind of, in my opinion, kind of told his hand, kind of showed where he's at. And I'm going with Michael Chiesa there. I think he's going to be able to get the job done. I think that he's going to be able to get the submission in round three by rear naked choke. And up next we have a fight I've been looking forward to. One of my, my personal favorite fights on the card, Fritz Segato against Derek Lewis. Just for the sheer violence of it, you know, man. Like, both these guys are coming in and coming in for one thing. They've been talking a lot of shit. And they're going to come in to, you know, get knocked out or knock someone out. You know, kill or be killed. And, um, you know, both of them just... Have sheer power, man. Both of them can knock you out with one shot. I think that on the feet, obviously, Francis Tegado is a little bit more polished. He throws with, you know, a little bit more combinations. He'll throw the jab out there. Um, a little bit more balanced. A little bit cleaner with his movement. But Derek Lewis is not someone you could sleep on. He's very athletic. I think he's a little bit more athletic than Francis Tegado. I think Tegado is a little bit stiff, man. And 
Derek Lewis is one of those heavyweights that can move. He can throw spinny kick kicks. He's more athletic in terms of that than Francis Ngannou. And, you know, the guys that Ngannou's knocked out, guys like Andre Arlovsky, um, Andre Arlovsky can move. He's very athletic as well, but he's smaller heavyweight. Obviously been hit a lot. Obviously been knocked out a lot. So, I have to put that in account. Overeem is another one of those more robotic um, guys where he has good movement. But he's not like a Derek Lewis, in my opinion. Explosive. Like, I don't know. He's older as well. Also been knocked out. Maybe Overeem isn't a great example. He kind of has it. But he's also older as well. And I just think that, man, I think Derek Lewis is going to be a little bit quicker. I think he's, um, you know, has a little bit better cardio. He's the one that's able to get these third-round finishes. He's the one that's able to kind of, you know, he's kind of like Yo Romero where he'll stop and start. He rests. That explodes, rests, and explodes. And I don't know, man. I think that he's also the better grappler. I think that if they get in the clinch, he tries to take him down. I think he might be able to do that. And if he does, I don't think it's going to be like Stipe, where Stipe is just trying to hold him down. I think Derek Lewis is going to try to posture up and land some big shots, try to knock out Francis Sagadu. And um, I don't know, man. I'm going to ride the hype here. I'm going to go with Derek Lewis by. Second round, ground pound TKO. I think Derek Lewis could be able to do it. And um, nothing against Fred Sagadu. He's traded with Syndicate. Traded there with John Wood now. So he's definitely getting some better coaching. And um, we're going to see, man. If he comes out and smokes Derek Lewis, then maybe he's the real deal. Maybe he just, you know, took that one step back to Stipe. And we're going to see him rise back up. But I'm going to go with Derek Lewis here. I think Derek Lewis is gonna, has a little more, bit more heart. And I think he's going to pull it out, man. I'm going to go with Derek Lewis. And up next, Max Holloway gets Brian Ortega. And shit, man. Pff, what more could you ask for with this fight? <laughs> Just two of the two of the best young fighters in the UFC. Everyone, you know, talks about Brian Ortega being that young up and cover. But they forget Max is 26 as well. Max is younger than Brian Ortega. He's just been in the UFC so long, man. He's been in the UFC, I think, since his third or fourth fight. Um... Since his fourth fight, man, his fourth, his fifth fight was uh, a lot of dusted Poye. So he's won 13 consecutive fights in the UFC as well. I mean, how incredible is that? It's just crazy winning streak, and uh, he's just a beast, man. He's beat Jose Aldo twice, beat Anthony Pettis, Ricardo Lamas, Jeremy Stevens, Cub Swanson, Charles Oliveira. I mean, Andre Feely. So many guys, man. And for Brian. Brad Ortega is so dangerous as well. Beat guys like Frank Edgar Cub, Hinato Moicano. I mean, both these guys are just peaking right at the right time. And for Max Holloway, very crisp boxing style. Almost, in my opinion, has a very similar, you know, type game to like that of like a Nick Diaz. Used a lot of same techniques as Nick Diaz as well. Nice check left hook. Good lead hand. You'll pull out with it. Land the one, two. Come around over the top. Change positions. Land his overhead. Uh, Judge's chin out, try to go, you try to come in with counters. He likes to talk like Nick as well, play with his hands down, makes himself long. He has a, a long volume style, he tries to accumulate shots, eventually he'll hurt you, swarm you, take you out. Doesn't get tired, it's a pretty solid shit as well. Good lateral footwork, he'll need to use that, throw a lot of combinations to try to keep Ortega off of because I do think Ortega has big power, he's going to try to cut forward. And, um, I think he's going to need to throw a ton of punches and uh, make Ortega respect him, not want to just come inside with no fear. And uh, Max is a piston like one, too. He just shoots it down the middle. Big power. He dropped Aldo with it. Finish it back to back time. Just submit him as the man to beat 145 pounds, man. He'll attack with uppercuts, hooks to the body, extremely fluid with his hands. Once he gets his confidence, his rhythm going, he'll start talking to you or get in your head. He seems to start a bit slow. Needs time to actually get going in fights. But he actually has great takedown defense, especially against the cage. He'll get the wizard. He'll use great wrist control, heavy hips, and other takedowns. He has defended all 27 of his takedowns in his last 10 fights. And for Brian Ortega, man, he has six consecutive finishes in the UFC. He's never uh, out of a fight. You know, he lost, he was down 2-0 to Tavares, Boycotto, and Guida before getting the finish in round three. And he's known for his jiu-jitsu. It's some of the most dangerous in the UFC. Off his back, he's fantastic with triangles. He's finished four of them in his career. He also has amazing guillotines and 
His squeeze is unreal. He was able to catch Boycano in the guillotine when he went for a takedown. And uh, caught Cub Swanson, that standing guillotine, obviously. Forced people to become uncomfortable and shoot against him with extreme pressure. Walks forward, has an amazing chin and cardio, but really only throws hands. He has a solid jab. He'll throw a nice overhand right, nice uppercut as well. He'll throw a body and head kicks. If you start to run to try to cut off the cage, you can't get tagged with overhands and straight punches. Takes them very well, though. And Moicano is attacking with body head, uh, body head finishing combinations with kicks extremely well. Ortega doesn't check leg kicks, just kind of takes them. He had a great step in knee against Clay Guida. Turns up the pressure when he needs to get the finish. He doesn't really have offensive wrestling. And while he was able to get club in a standing guillotine, Cub has always had problems with grapplers. Ortega gets some, uh, sometimes contend to strike or lose a striking battle. He switches stances, shoots out his jab for both stances. And uh, when he gets a hold of your neck, the fight's over, man. He's undefeated. He's a huge danger. Very big guy. I think regardless, um, the person that loses this fight is probably going to go up to 155 pounds, in my opinion. And uh, I'm going to go with Max Holloway. I think Max Holloway is just too much um, better on the feet. I know that he landed that nice uppercut against Frankie Edgar. But I just think that Max Holloway is a great chin, great boxing combinations, very crisp, very clean. I think he's a little bit better with his combinations than uh, Brian Ortega. I think he has a little bit better footwork. I think that eventually he's going to start pushing Ortega back. I think both these guys have phenomenal cardio. Both these guys have phenomenal chins, very big for the division. So, man, I just think that Max Holloway is going to be able to pull it out. He's had more... Um, Experience in these five round fights, more experience as a champion. He's defended his belt already. And um, one of the best fights ever, man. Both these guys are extremely accomplished. Both these guys are very good, but gonna go with Max Holloway via decision in that one. And up next, DC against Stipe Miocic, man. Light heavyweight champ against the heavyweight champ. And shit, yeah, I mean, I'm excited for these two fights. I'm excited for this whole car, man. This whole weekend's pretty badass. I'm going to be out here for International Fight Week. If anyone's out here, man, put it in the comments. Um, if anyone's going to be out here for International Fight Week, maybe we can meet up. Maybe, uh, you know, catch the fights. Or, uh, you know, just, you know, chill. Maybe have a beer or something or do whatever. So, uh, if anyone's going to be here for International Fight Week, for sure, hit me up in the comments. Tell me where you're going to be, you know, where you're going to be staying at. If you want to meet up, maybe we could figure something out. Who knows? Or uh, do some of these events here this week on Fight Week. And, um... But, alright, back to this uh, fight. For DC, um, he's beaten the who's who of MMA. He's one of the best fighters in the history of the sport. Competed at heavyweight and light heavyweight. He won the titles in both divisions. He came in as an alternate. Won the Strike Force Heavyweight Grand Prix. He defeated people like Bigfoot Silva, Josh Barnett, Frank Beer, Roy Nelson. So a lot of big time heavyweights. Then he went down to light heavyweight, claimed the belt not once but twice. He's beaten guys like Dan Henderson. Anthony Johnson twice, uh, Alexander Gustafson, Anderson Silva. So he's definitely beat the who's who in MMA. And a win here, you could arguably say, with the uh, you know uncertainty in the Jones fights with the steroids, you could say he's one. He's the greatest of all time. It's ar arguable. And um, but he's a wrestler. He likes to grind on his opponents, hold on to you in the clinch, grind by hanging on your head, throwing knees, looking for single legs. Does a great job staying attached to his opponent. He has great timing on his shots, especially if you come in overzealous. He has a granite chain over history. He had a massive overhand right, massive head kick by Rumble, and uh, came back to win. Very powerful overhand right. Does a good job of attacking off the break, off the clips with punches. When he gets his hands together on a double leg, he's taking you for a ride. He has amazing cardio. Throws solid body kicks on top. You aren't getting uh, DC off you. And uh, he will wear on you in hard elbows, work submissions like Kimura's and chokes. And, um, you know, you saw in his fight against Volkan Ozdemir, just very good performance. He was actually even jabbing Ozdemir, and Ozdemir had that huge size advantage. And um, just very, very, very uh, impressive performance of that fight. And I just think that he's very good, man. He's like one of the greatest of all time for sure. He has that, he's able to get a jab off even though he's so small, which... Always surprised me how he's able to get inside, lay his jab. And uh, once he starts landing the jab, landing the overhead right, and you don't know whether he's going to throw that overhead right or duck under, get those double legs, 
he becomes someone that's almost impossible to beat, man. Once you start moving backwards on Daniel Cormier, he starts to smell blood, and the fight's going to be tough for you to win, man. It's going to be very tough. And, um, you know, Stipe Miocic, you know, the best heavyweight of all time in the UFC, most title defenses ever, and um, he's going to be looking to defend his belt here and try to make some history himself, you know, and uh, he's some guy that it seems like everyone seems to overlook him. You know, I picked him in that fight against Francis Ngannou, but I know the large majority of people picked Francis Ngannou. He was the underdog, and, um, you know, it seems like he never gets the full credit he deserves, but just being in this fight, I think, raises his profile. You know, it shows that he is, um, you know, worthy of a super fight. He's worthy of, um, you know, being one of the best fighters on the uh, face of play today. One of the best power foul fighters. So he's known for that. And, um, you know, it's good to see him getting that recognition. And uh, he's someone that's just very well-rounded. You know, very good boxing skills. Can uh, strike moving forward and moving backwards. You've seen that where against Junior Dos Santos, he really started to push the presser. And uh, knocked him out with that overhead right hand. Then you saw it as well against uh, Fabricio where he's moving backwards. Caught him with the punch. Knocked him out as well. So very crisp, clean boxing. Um, gets to that pocket. Really has good knockout power. And uh, very good takedowns as well. He's a good grinder. Showed that against Fred Singanu. Was able to continuously get that single leg. Continuously put him up against the cage. And uh, just beat him up. He always follows a game plan. Very smart guy. Very cerebral. He's never going to, you know, do anything stupid. Never going to um, break. Never going to do it. Neither of these guys have any um, quit in them. Neither of these guys are going to ever uh, give the, their opponent an easy way out. This is going to be a fight. Whoever wins is going to have to win, man. They're going to have to earn it. They're not going to get give it to them. And, um... I, I think that DC is going to win it, man. I think DC is going to be able to, um, I think he's going to, be able to out-wrestle Stipe. I think he's going to be able to get in on his legs. I think he's going to, be able to get in on that double leg. I think he's going to be able to back Stipe up eventually. I think he has relentless cardio, especially at heavyweight. I think it's going to be even better with his cardio. I think that the size difference is a little over-exaggerated. I think DC is a big guy. I think that he may even come in heavier than Stipe Miocic for this fight. And uh, he's came in at like 240 in some of his fights for uh, heavyweight fights that he's had in, in the past. And um, done very well at heavyweight. He's beat some huge guys, beat some great grapplers. He was slamming Josh Barnett on his head, man. And um, I just think DC's, DC is one of the greatest of all time, and I think he's going to get it done, man. So I'm going to go with Daniel Corbier, and uh, I'm going to go by uh, decision. I think it's going to be very close. I think he's going to win 3-2. to two. And uh, I'm going to go with Daniel Corbier. And um, for my most confident pick of the night, like I said, I'm going with Gokot Saki. And uh, if I were to give you guys a parlay of the week, I would say to go with Michael Chiesa and Gokot Saki as the parlay of the week. And, um, you know, some other things that I think could potentially be a good pick, I think potentially that Jamie Boyle against Emily Whitmire fight, to say that it goes to decision or over two and a half rounds, I think that's, you know, a pretty good pick, I think that Max, Max Griffin's obviously a good upset pick to have on there, I think, uh, potentially, uh, you could pay Paulo Costa by first round knockout, um, you know, some of those things I think are available there, Daniel Corby, obviously, I think the line's a little off on there, I think it should be much closer, and, um, so there it is, man, there's the breakdown for UFC 226, and like I said, I'm going to be trying to come back on Tuesday. At the latest, it'll be Wednesday for the uh, Ultimate Fighter Finale. Um, and uh, I'll give you guys some mix. Uh, some comments that they wanted me to give you guys some parlays over the two cards. So I'll do that as well. Give you guys kind of some final many tips on that um, video as well. So tune into that. Make sure you're subscribed so you can get the notification. And uh, thanks for watching, guys. Hope you guys have a great day. Hope you guys have a great 4th of July. Like I said, if anyone's coming out here for International Fight Week, hit me up. Maybe we can meet up, go to some events, do some cool stuff. So, all right, guys, thanks for watching. And, uh, you know, let's win these bets.